righty. Let's see. Six, seven, six, one, three, hold the God's unchanging hand. If you have it, let us begin. Time is filled with self-transition. Not of earth a move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. You got all to his hands to God's unchanging let me hear now, all to his hands, so God's unchanging hand. You gotta build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Oh, trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever is may bring, if I only find forsaken, stand more closely to him, clean. You got all to his hands, to God's unchanging. Let me hear now all to his hands, to God's unchanging hand, you gotta build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright the So well, view you got all to his hands, to God's unchanging. And let me hear you now, all to his hands, to God's unchanging. And you gotta build your hopes on things eternal. All to God's unchanging. You got all to his hand, to God's unchanging. Let me hear you now, all to his hand, to God's unchanging. And you got to build your hopes on things eternal. All to God's unchanging hand. Song before communion will be 382. Mm. 382. Why did my Savior come to earth? Okay. <coughs> 382. If you have it, let us begin. Why did my Savior come to earth? And to the humble go, why did he choose the lowly birth? Because he loved me so. Well, he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me, he loved me so well, he gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Oh, why did he drink the bitter cup? Of sorrow, pain, and woe. Oh, why on the cross we lifted up? Because he loved me so. 
came because he had a mission. His mission, as we all know, was to be placed on that cross and to die. To die for you, to die for me, uh, and to sacrifice his blood to that end. And when he met with his apostles the night before the terrible scourging began, he had a feast with them. Some would say, well, it wasn't a big feast, but it was a feast. Um, and in order to commemorate the fact that he was going to leave them, he wanted to give them something to remember him by that they would never forget and that they passed this on through the ages so everybody would remember why he came to this earth. Uh, and so he instituted the Last Supper, the bread, the loaf, uh, and the fruit of the vine, the wine. We're about to take that now, uh, and will you join with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Father, it's difficult for us to understand the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us, that he willingly made by placing him in the hands of the authorities, knowing that he was going to be scourged, beaten, and ultimately crucified on that cross. And he did it because he loved us. And he did it because he loved you, and he was obedient to you. We pray, Father, that we can have the same sense of obedience uh, that we can have the same sense of love and commitment. And as we take this loaf this morning, representing his body, we pray we do it in a way that is meaningful to you, but also meaningful to us, with an open heart, with love in our heart for him and the sacrifice he made. In his name we pray. Amen. And when he finished passing the bread about, <clears throat> he then passed a cup to them, told them that as they partake of the, the fruit of the vine, that symbolically they were sharing in his blood that he was sharing for them. Please join with me. Father, we know that the lifeblood of Jesus was lost on that cross. And we met with his apostles and instituted the 
Last Supper, a supper which we still commemorate and celebrate thousands of years later, commemorating the fact that he made the sacrifice for us. We taking this fruit of the vine, Father, in the same way that the apostles did then in remembrance of that night. Uh, and as we take it now, we are remembering that night and mostly remembering the following day when uh, things were carried out as scripture beheld. Father, we love him so much for making that sacrifice. When we take this vine, the fruit of the vine, we pray that our hearts are open and it's pleasing to you. In his name we pray. Amen. Giving is so much a part of our Christian heritage. Giving by Jesus, giving his life, giving his blood, giving his wisdom, giving his time, giving us his patience. So much giving on behalf of the Lord. And we accept all of that. And we in turn have an opportunity to give. Give in return for that which we've been blessed with, that which we've been made stewards for, and as we give today, uh, we pray that uh, it's going to be acceptable to the Lord. Please bow with me. Father, as we prepare to give back, we are so thankful that we're in a position to give back. Some are not able to give back much. Some are able to give back a lot. Some are able to give back more. Whatever we're able to give back, Father, we pray that you accept it uh, on behalf of the intentions that we have in our heart to be contributing, to be giving, to be loving as your son was such to us. We pray this in your, holy, your son's holy name. Amen. Before this morning's scripture reading, we'll be do, doing um, hymn number 742, uh, verses 1, 2, 3. When upon life's billows. Time together, let us sing. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. You ought to count your blessings, name, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. You ought to count your many blessings. See what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy? You are called to bear. Count your many blessings every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by you ought to count your blessings name name them one by one count your blessings see what see what god has done you ought to count your blessings name them one by one you ought to count your many blessings, see what God hath done. 
So amidst the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journeys, and you ought to count your blessings, name them, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what, see what God has done. You ought to count your blessings, name them one by one. You ought to count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. Morning, church. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Galatians 5, verses 13 through 16. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That was Galatians 5, verses 13 through 16. The song before we have our minister, Brother Ben, come up to do our lesson will be 867. 867, to Cannon's land, I'm on my way. Eight six seven to Cannon's Land. I'm on my way. If you have it, let's begin. To Cannon's Land, I'm on my way, where the soul of man never dies. Oh my darkest night, well turn to day, where the soul of man. Never die, oh no, sad, farewell, oh no, sad, then not, oh well, oh, is love and the soul. soul of man never dies, and I will spend eternity where the soul of man never dies, oh no soul of man never dies. Oh, it shines the light, the source of home, where the soul of man never dies. Oh, no soul of man never dies. I'm on my way to that land where the soul of man never dies. Oh, where there will be no parting where the soul of man never die. 
today, say amen. It's a blessing to be amongst the saints of God on today. If you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest here at the Lehigh Valley Church of Christ. Uh, please fill out one of our visitors' cards so that at the end of service today, we can properly thank you for being with us here in our worship service on today. Uh, please be praying. We have a number of members that are traveling, uh, and we have a few members that are uh, sick, uh, and so we want to be in prayer uh, for them as well. I'm also soliciting personal prayers. Uh, over the last month, I've been uh, taking a lot of uh, medical tests and blood work, um, and so uh, I'm praying for favorable outcomes on that, so I'm just asking that you will uh, continue to keep me uh, in your prayers as well as my wife and my family. Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 uh, we want to thank all the brothers today who uh, served so far in the worship service. Uh, we will begin at verse number 13, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Paul says these words to the church at Galatia. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen? A relationship with God is a long-term commitment. It's a commitment. Uh, uh, August 12th, 1989, I stood at my uncle's house. There was my uncle, there was Annette, and there was me. And I made a lifelong commitment to her, and we were married. My commitment was death do us part. For rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, right? That is a commitment. When we became Christians, and, and we decided that we were going to uh, give our lives to Christ. At the moment that we were baptized, right, we said that we were committing ourselves uh, to uh, uh, the life of being a Christian. So a relationship with God is a commitment. It's easy to throw in the towel and give up. I'm tired. People are talking about me. People don't like me. The church isn't doing well. That doesn't negate your commitment. When we said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's a marriage. That's a commitment. That's a covenant. Right? And that's what we are called to do. Christians are called and our Christians are saved to serve. And we're going to look at this uh, uh, Christian service cup from a comprehensive biblical perspective. Let us consider that enjoying and fulfilling our Christian relationship with God involves accepting the responsibilities that are inherent in that relationship. See, every right implies a responsibility. Paul says, you're called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Right? Every opportunity implies uh, an obligation. We are called to go out and save others. Every possession implies a duty. A relationship with God without service is like a tree without roots. It cannot grow. And something that does not grow will what? Eventually die. 
A duty with no service is like a tree with no fruit. It cannot provide substance and it will not spread. It is through the fruit that a tree makes its seeds. We're still on the concept of harvesting, sowing and reaping, right? No fruit means no seed. No seed means no growth and no truth to sow. A Christian is a person that is called to serve God. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. Christians have an obligation to fulfill their individual service. You cannot say you're a Christian and you come in and you sit on the seat of do nothing. We must serve, right? Paul wrote in Colossians 4, and I say to Acapius, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord. The minute that you became a Christian, God gave you an assignment. You have to find out what that assignment is. We can help you to, to, to uh, find out what your gift is. And, and, and Lord have mercy, please work within that anointing. Amen. Don't work in somebody else's gift. Stay in your own lane. And so Paul told this uh, gentleman uh, in the church in Colossae to fulfill the ministry he has been given. Each of us has a ministry that God wants us to fulfill. This teaches us individual personal service. See, all Christians are to view their service on a personal level. Every day, you ought to wake up and say, what can I do to serve God? Where do I fit in? How can I help? Certainly, the body of Christ engages in an organized group effort, right? And we love that. But, but you as an individual, me as an individual, we have something individually that we need to be doing in the kingdom. Right? So each group consists of individuals. The Lehigh Valley Church of Christ uh, consists of almost 100 people. Right? And each of us has a service that we need to be doing to reach the common goal of going to heaven. And so each individual in a group has a specific responsibility. The spiritual kingdom, which we are members of, is a realm of activity. We can see this evident in various terms used by the apostles when they wrote their specific books. Listen, if I just sat around and did nothing all day, what would happen to me? Right? I, 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 I'm dying every day. You know, every day that I wake up and live, I'm dying. But I need to be active. You know, when people, uh, 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 it's amazing to me that people that retire, they still keep busy. Right? Because they don't want to just wither away. Right? Uh, uh, those of us that are younger need to take uh, some lessons from that. Right? Right? When it comes to uh, the Christian realm, God says, I expect you to be doing something in my kingdom. We are described as branches by Christ. And what did he say? That if, if something is not bringing forth fruit, what does he do? He cuts it off. He prunes it. Why? Because it's bearing no fruit. And he says, if you're not bearing any fruit, on this vine, then you are no good to me. See, Christians described as branches, we are expected to bear fruit. What's that mean? Activity. Jesus says that those who do not bear fruit, they will be pruned and they will be burned. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 and 6. Christians are illustrated as farmers. He, say, but, he said, but this I say, he that sows sparingly shall what? Reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Farmers who expect to be successful are busy. 
they, they get in before the season, Sister Mary Ann, and they start to till the ground. And after they till the ground, then there's something else that they're doing. And then they plant seed. And after they plant seed, they're still busy. They're not idle. Christians are never to be idle. Christians have to work hard at it. Hard-working Christians like farmers will sow and reap we are described as soldiers in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, therefore, uh, uh, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warp entangle himself with the affairs of this life. See, when I am busy for the Lord, I don't have time for foolishness and mess. Because I'm busy. I know what's ahead of me. God has focus in my heart. And, and I know that I should be doing something active in the kingdom. We are described as athletes in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. He says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So he says, run. That's activity. We are described as workers, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. That means I should be doing something. I should be serving somebody. Biblical faith is not passive. True faith is a work. Paul instructed Timothy to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth when I study the word. Uh, Brother Ricardo, I'm working. I'm active. We ought to be laborers. Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous. But what? The labors are few. All of these terms that we just talked about, we talked about farmers, we talked about soldiers, we talked about athletes, we talked about workers, we talked about laborers, these all represent See, faithful Christian service is more than just saying, Lord, Lord, or I love you, Lord. If I love him, then I, it, it's not enough for me to say, I love my wife and I never do anything for her. She's going to look at me like I'm crazy and say uh, something else. Amen. <laughs> Amen. She says, if you love me, you got to show me that you love me. We do that by our actions. And an, an examination of these terms used to describe members of the kingdom of God shows that we are expected. There's an expectation for you to be fruitful, and there is an expectation for you to be productive. When I used to work at FedEx, I worked in the second largest hub in the country. There was 4,000 employees, and every night about midnight, we would go in there, and we had the planes coming in from, from, from all the international flights, and then we had all the local flights come in, and, and we had 40 lines, and all of those packages had to go through those lines, and they judged you based on your productivity. They would say, Derek, you're not running enough packages through there. You got to be a little bit faster, right? And I mean, they come in seconds. Uh, here, here's a slope, and, and, and they just drop. You got to get them on the line. And listen, God is looking at us, right? And, and he says we got to be productive. We have to be like farmers who sow many seeds. We ought to protect and defend the truth like good soldiers, and we ought to strive for the goal with patience and perseverance like an athlete working hard and laboring in the, in the, in the service of Christ. Sometimes we look at athletes and, and, and that have won championships and, and we say, well, you know, uh, how did you get to that point? And a lot of times uh, a good athlete will tell you how they struggled to get to where they are. They had to work at it. They had to get in the gym at 5 a.m. They had to get in the gym at 5 p.m. They had to lift weights. They had to run. They had to jump. They had to do everything. And I tell young athletes today, I say, the key to your success is doing things off the field, not on the field. And that's how it is. We have to be working. We have to be laboring. Why? Because we are expected to be faithful. We are expected. 
to be faithful. It's not a choice in the matter. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to serve in the kingdom of God, you must be faithful. We are to be fit for God's use in his kingdom, right? We got to be fit. That means that I got to be eating a good diet. Amen. Right? I got to be active. You know, when you're not active, you just sit there like a bump on a log, right? And you're no good. You start to get stiff, and, 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 and you can't be of good use like that, right? I had to make up in my mind five years ago, I said, I'm too heavy. I can't do what I need to do in the kingdom of God. Thank God, right? I've dropped from 383 to 224. I can, I can go, Maggie. I can do what I need to do. I don't feel it's tired anymore. I want to be used in the kingdom of God. I can't be used in the kingdom of God, and I'm not fit. We are expected to be profitable, right? And, and that just is not from a monetary way. It's from a spiritual way. He says, uh, 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 Second Timothy, Luke was, uh, Luke, only Luke is with me. He said, take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable for me and the ministry. You need people there that's going to be a support system for you. Why? We are expected to build each other up. We are expected to be profitable. Paul wanted Timothy to bring Mark because he was profitable. Mark was someone Paul knew that he could depend on. I need some dependable people in here. Amen. In all this, we should see that Christians are a part of a kingdom of service. What does Christian activity consist of? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, here's what Christian service consists of. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul is telling the Christians at Corinth uh, to, to abound. He says, that means to be plentiful in the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord, then, you may be asking? We are saved to serve, so what should I be doing? Let me give you three things that we should be doing as a church. Three basic works of the church or the body of Christ is this. Acts of benevolence, number one. Galatians 6, 9, and 10. He says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. There are some times when you walk as a Christian, Brother Larry, you're going to get tired. You're going to be fatigued. Can you imagine God saying to you, I'm going to... Uh, Jeremiah, I want you to preach, and, and nobody's going to hear what you're saying, but I still need you to preach. That can be tiresome. Can you imagine Jesus doing all of these works uh, just to turn around and then they crucify him? Right? But he said, Paul says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season. See, when we're working for the Lord, what we're doing is sowing. We're sowing seeds. We're sowing seeds. And Paul says, in due season, we will reap if we faint not. So he says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to who? All men. Especially those who are of the household of faith. We are supposed to be generous and do good things for all people, both sinners and Christians. When we see a Christian in need, we are obligated to help them. Jesus went into more detail in Matthew 25. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me not. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and you didn't visit me. I was in prison and you didn't come to me. 
We are engaged, or we so are supposed to be engaged uh, in acts of kindness, generosity, and concern for those who are elderly. Amen. We're supposed to be taking care of our elderly members. We're supposed to be taking care of our sick members. We are supposed to be taking care of those who are afflicted in and out of the church. That's one of the basic works of the church. Secondly, edification. Acts of benevolence, one. Edification is two. We are to work to edify or build up the body of Christ. This means that we are supposed to instruct ourselves and build each other up in the knowledge of God. Why does that need to happen, preacher? Paul says in Ephesians 4. In, in Ephesians 4, he talks, in the first part of Ephesians 4, uh, he, talk, he said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Then he goes into the fact uh, of, of the leadership of the church, right? He says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some elders. Why? Uh, uh, for the work of the ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ. Why did you give these gifts to the church, Jesus? That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro. And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of man. And cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things which is the head even Christ. Why, Jesus, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Every member of your body is important to you. Amen. Let something start acting up in your body. Amen. I'm standing up here preaching to you right now, and my shoulder just start hurting. Yeah, I feel it. Amen. Let something start messing up. You're going to feel it, and you're going to do something about it. The same way in the church, when members of the church are hurting, we should be doing something about it. We should be building them up. When somebody is, 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 has gotten blessed by God, amen, we ought to be there to cheer them on. Amen. We shouldn't be jealous of, of God blessing them. Uh, we should be saying, uh, your blessing is my blessing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It is. Amen. So, so the three basic works of the church is the acts of benevolence, uh, uh, edification, and evangelism. There are many ways that we can achieve this. Uh, we ought to teach 2 Timothy 2.24, which says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, Apt to teach, patient. Apt means willing and, a, and able. We have to be three things in the kingdom of God. Faithful, available, and teachable. Amen. We ought to preach. Preach the word. I can't be up here and just, oh, Lord. No, 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 no. Y'all know who I'm talking about when I say that. Amen. I have to preach unto you the unadulterated word of God. I have to preach it in season, out of season, reprove. Sometimes we have to get up here and teach again some things, right? Rebuke. Sometimes we need to be warned and exhort. We need to be built up with all long suffering and doctrine. We ought to preach only the word. I can't get up here and talk about myself and my opinions and what I think. No, I have to preach the word. We ought to do it in season, out of season, Meaning whenever I get the opportunity to do it, we ought to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, which means convince, correct, and encourage. How do we do this? With all long suffering and doctrine, patience, kindness. My mentor, I love him so much because uh, uh, he looks at every person, and, and I, I don't know how he does it, uh, uh, because if I, if, if, you know, I need prayer in that. Amen. He sees each individual and he is so patient. Doesn't matter what you've done in your life. He's patient. He's long-suffering. But that's what we are called to do. That's our calling. Right? 
That's a part of our Christian service. This is our guide for doctrine or teaching in the body of Christ. This means telling others about Christ when we have the opportunity. It means looking for opportunities and acting on them when we find them. People outside the body of Christ, they see us doing good and living right and serving others and living to a higher standard. They want to be a part of that. They see our joy and hope evident in our behaviors and in our actions. They want to be a part of that. They see that we are a family, and they say, I want to join in that family. There are lots of ways that we can evangelize. It may be as simple as handing someone a card or a door hanger or a track or asking them if they would like to come to a service. It might be that they see your dedication and your devotion, and they want more. There are, those are the three basic acts of the church. Why, preacher, we are called to serve. We are called to serve. We serve God by doing good to others. Building ourselves up in the faith and evangelizing or spreading the good news. See, Christianity is not a passive system of faith. It is a system of action. What did James say? Faith without works is what? Dead. And it is upon this action or service that exists in the body of Christ that we depend on. As I look out and I look at each and one of you, I can say I want to depend on you. We had two of our song leaders out today, right? So we have to depend on somebody to get up there and do it. Don't ask me. Amen. It's not my gift. <laughs> I will defer to the next person. Amen. And if we as members of the church of Christ in this community do not fulfill our obligations of service, this congregation will be dead. We are assembled here today because someone many decades ago did their jobs. And if we are going, and if this congregation is going to be here another 10 years or 20 years or 30 years from now, we all have to be active. What is the correct attitude that we should have about our service? We need to develop certain attitudes when it comes to our Christian work. First of all, we need to be grateful for the opportunity to serve. Amen. Paul says in Timothy, he says, and I thank God. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who have enabled me that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. We have to be grateful that we have the opportunity to serve. Paul told Timothy, he said, you need to step up. You need to live in as, a, as an example. You need to show others how to live, not just preaching to them. And then Paul taught the Christians in Philippi. He says, do all things without murmuring and dispute. You should not have to walk in the church, walk into a business meeting, and somebody is complaining every time. He says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. We have to have a positive attitude and an upbeat attitude in our service for Christ. Instead of bringing murmuring and complaining, what's the solution to the problem? Amen. We ought to show enthusiasm and be je and zealous and eager. Titus 2 says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purifying unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We, must, we ought to be persistent in our service. Keep on serving. Even when Satan is fighting you, and listen, there's a lot of fight going on right now. Amen. There's a lot of fight going on right now. I, I'm getting calls from uh, Connecticut and, and New York. I'm getting calls from all over the brotherhood asking for prayer and help and guidance and counseling. Satan is out there and he's fighting. We have to fight back. How do I do that? Keep serving the Lord. We need to ask these questions. In what ways am I especially blessed by God? 
What do I possess that might be useful in the work of the Lord? What do I derive fulfillment from doing? We have so many gifts and talents in this church. What do I enjoy doing? What comes naturally for me? What might I learn to do? Some things that uh, it might be new to you, but learn how to do it. You might be gifted in it and you don't know that you are. We are more comfortable with doing things that fit in with our ability that comes naturally for us. So we need to watch for opportunities to fit within our abilities. But that does not stop with just that. What might we learn to do? What other abilities may we be able to develop that would aid in our service to the body of Christ? What needs to be done? What needs to be done in the Lord's work? Look around Lehigh Valley. What needs to be done here? We talked about this uh, in our congregational meeting. There are a lot of things that need to be done. You might be the one that can do it. What spiritual restrictions govern the work? I believe here we don't have any spiritual restrictions. Amen. What other factors may limit my opportunity? Listen, if you come to me and you say, Brother Bean, can I? Yes, you can. Amen. We need you in the work of the Lord. What is now being done inadequately that I can fix to help it work? What are others doing that I need or can help with? Ask all of these questions. This will help you in your Christian service. All of these things need to be examined if there is a need. Then we should be working hard to try to fill that need. And if there's a need we can't feel, then we should be working to develop the ability to do so or look around and see who can do it. And we need to be building up others who are trying to do them. If somebody is in here and they're working, amen, don't tear them down. Build them up. Encourage them. Be their cheerleader. Amen. The inability to do something that it, it does not necessarily excuse us from doing it. And finally, let us take a look at some of these uh, various terms for where we ought to serve as Christians. Christ frequently used the world as what a vineyard. He spoke of vine dressers and laborers in his teaching. The imagery of a vineyard suggests a place where work is performed. When one thinks of a vineyard and they know what a vineyard is like, then they know that it is not a place of rest and relaxation. A vineyard is a place where work is done. Another term that Jesus used to describe the world was the harvest. We're going right back to our theme for this month, right? Other related terms in association with the harvest is sowers, reapers, laborers. All these terms portray the imagery of action. Notice Jesus' usage of these terms. He says, then said he unto the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, the laborers are few. Pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers. Action workers. Amen. And all of these terms suggest the kingdom of Christ as being a place where members are busy and active. Christians are saved to serve in the vineyard of the Lord. Christians are saved to serve in God's harvest. Christians are saved to serve Christ. Jesus made it plain in Matthew 25 that when we serve others, we serve Christ. And when we fail to serve others, then we fail to serve Christ. We saw earlier that a big part of our Christian service is out in the world. The world is God's vineyard. The, wor the, the world is God's harvest. Go ye into all the 
world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are saved to serve. Repeat that after me. I am saved to serve. Amen. And the world is a big part of where we are expected to serve. Jesus did not say, sit you in the pews. Amen. He said, go into all the world. The world starts just outside of those doors. This is where Jesus told us to go. That is the vineyard that we are expected to work in. That is the harvest where we are expected to reap. There is, the need is there. Amen. The harvest is plenteous. We are living in a mission field. We have given, uh, uh, we have been given some practical advice over the last few weeks on how to accomplish this. My encouragement to us today, let's work together. Amen. We have the plan. The plan is right here inside the word of God. Let's serve together the best way that we can. We are Christians. We are saved to serve. So let's examine ourselves and examine the need. As long as there is one soul that is lost in the world, we are obligated to be salt of the earth and light of the world. There is more to do. Listen, we can do it. How many of you believe that today? We can do it. There is more need. Can we feel it? Yes. There is an opportunity that we can take advantage of. What can we do to better serve? There are questions we must ask ourselves on a daily basis. We just never let ourselves, or we should never let ourselves become complacent. We should always strive to grow stronger. You know, if, 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 if I want to be uh, 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 like Arnold Schwarzenegger, amen, if I want to be built like the rock, you know, I got to go in the gym, Sister Ramona, amen, and I got to do, do the work. I got to lift weights. I got I to gotta get my stamina up, right? I can't say I want to be uh, uh, Mr. Bodybuilder and then I, I don't go in and I don't lift any weights. That doesn't work. Amen. And I got to eat right. <laughs> Amen. If I eat right, if I get in there and I, I spend my time in the gym, I got a goal in mind, this is what I want to do, then I'll be able to accomplish it. Spiritually speaking, if I, if I want to see this building full, I got to go out there, and the, the harvest is plenteous. I got to go out there, and I got to do some work. I got to plant some seeds. If I don't plant any seeds, then how can I expect a harvest? No seed, no harvest. What you sow, you're going to reap. If I, if I don't sow anything, I can't reap anything. Hebrews 12, as we close. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This is, this is, this is, a, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's longevity. I believe Janie and Tom, you've got over 50 years of marriage. Am I correct when I say that? That's longevity. Amen. That's patience. That's long suffering. That's love. Amen. That's <laughs> I'm not saying that negatively. Amen. And it's love and devotion, right? It's honor and respect. Amen. When we look at marriage, we need to look. I'm not marrying a perfect person. Amen. All of us are imperfect. There was only one perfect person, and that's Jesus. Right? And so when I commit myself to the Lord, I'm committing myself to him for life. 
And so I'm sure that Janie and Tom can really teach us a lot of life lessons on, on love and marriage, right? How, how do I make it 50 years? My, par- my grandparents had 62 years before my grandmother died, and that, that just amazed me. And it used to amaze me that as long as they was married, all my grandfather had to do was say a couple words. And my grandmother lit up like a flashlight. Amen. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And the Hebrew writer says, I look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. In your work as a Christian, You're going to endure some things that you don't like. People are going to try to shame you. But the Bible says that Jesus is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For to consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Listen, if they did it to Jesus, they sure enough going to do it to you and me. But we have to press on. We have to keep fighting. We have to keep serving. That's the word of today. Serving. Be active. Be, uh, 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 you know, keep being active in the work of the Lord. Amen? Take Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, and, and study that in your personal time with the Lord on this week. I guarantee you that it will bless your life. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, how do I become a Christian on today? You hear the gospel. I've given you a snippet from the word of God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Are you willing to make a change in your mind that says no to sin and yes to God? That's repentance. In order for me to become a Christian, I must change. Are you willing to stand before this audience and confess that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? If you do, we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. If you're here today and you stand in the need of prayer, listen. Sometimes in your walk as a Christian, you're going to endure some hardships. Right? And and sometimes you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. And sometimes you just need to allow the church to pray for you. We want to connect with you on today. We want to pray for you. James says that the energetic, passionate prayers of the righteous avails much. Let's all be standing.